Hello and welcome to GameSack. We've taken a look at games that were left in one country or another. Now we're going to take a look at games that just did not come out in this episode in the USA. So. Yeah, they probably came out in multiple other countries, but not the USA for some stupid reason. Very stupid mm -hmm. reasons. Anyway, we've got a few games to show you, a few good ones, so let's just get right on into it. Twin B, Rainbow Bell Adventure is a side-scrolling action platformer by Konami. This Super Nintendo game was released in Japan and Europe, but was sadly left out of North America. As you know, Twin B is primarily a vertical shooter, and this game is the first departure for the series into another genre. At the beginning of a single player game, you can pick one of three Twin Bees to play as. The three characters control the same, but have slightly different attributes when it comes to weapon charging and flight charging. What is this charging, you ask? You can charge a punch shot that will let off a blast that will kill enemies from a distance, and you can also break through walls. Your character can also charge up its rockets to fly. So you have one character that has equal charge times. Another character will have a shorter charge time for punch, but a longer charge time for rockets. And of course, the last character will have a longer charge time for punch and a shorter charge time for rockets. Being a ship, you'd think that you'd just be able to fly around the screen as much as you want. This is not the case, as primarily you'll be walking through each stage. Your ship can fly, but the problem is you have no control over its path. The only thing that you control is the trajectory, kind of like Rocket Knight. After you build up your rocket gauge, just point in the direction you want to go and let go of the button. A lot of the stages are designed with this in mind and have walls for you to aim at that will help guide your ship along a course. And some of them aren't set up like this and you can easily drop into some spikes when your rockets run out of fuel. As with the Twin B Shooter, you collect colored bells to power up your ship. When you kill an enemy, they will release one of these bells. Depending on the color of the bell when you collect it, a certain attribute will be powered up. These range from speed, which of course lets you move faster, a laser that lets you shoot a blast across the screen, or even a weapon power-up which lets you use a weapon such as a hammer instead of your punch. There's also options for your ship which basically let you take a hit without losing life from your life bar. The object of each level, of course, is to reach the goal. There's no time limit and you can go back and forth all throughout each area as much as you want before you reach the goal. This is great because each level has tons of stuff to collect and also tons of hidden areas. Besides the bells that power up your ship, there's a given number of other bells to collect. These are different in shape and are all the same champagne color. I'm not sure what happens when you collect all of these bells, but I do know that for every 100 you collect it will replenish your life bar. This is good because the game can be difficult. You can also collect keys which will open doors in each area. Behind these doors you'll find lots of those champagne colored bells and other items like a baseball, bullet, and a bomb. These are handy and you use them against your enemies. The baseball when thrown will bounce around the screen and take out an enemy in its path. The bullet acts as a heat seeker and will follow and kill your enemies. The bomb is the best as once you throw it, it instantly clears the screen of any enemy. Generally the game is fun to play and the levels are all decently sized. I like that you can keep charging your rockets and blast off into outer space. This doesn't do anything but it's just a fun distraction. There's also a two player battle game on here. Duke it out with your friend on a variety of stages and the first to kill twice is the winner. There's much better two player games out there so this mode won't get much use. Still it's there and more is better than less I guess. I'm pretty bummed that this game didn't come out in the US. So bummed that I bought the Japanese version so I could have it. If you get a chance to play this, try it, you might like it. Here's some NES games that never came out in the US. First up is Devil World. Everyone and their mom talks about this game, so I'll keep it short. Basically, you play as some sort of religious bubble bobble character who has to ward off the devil who happens to be evil. As always, there are two ways to defeat the devil. The first way is to grab your crucifix and eat all of the dots. You can't eat the dots unless you're holding the crucifix and the crucifixes don't last long. Gotta get a better carpenter to build those, I guess. Eat all of the dots and the devil is defeated once and for all. In the next area, he's back. So the second way to defeat the devil is to grab all of the holy bibles and shove them into the box in the center. Get all four of them in and again, the devil will be defeated once and for all. When you have a bible or a crucifix, you can also shoot flames to smite the non-believers because you have God on your side. Anyway, the game is moderately fun, but the random scrolling is kind of bothersome, especially because it can be really jerky. This was released in Japan and Europe, but of course Nintendo wouldn't allow the religious imagery over here. I think this game gets a lot of notoriety because it happens to be made by good old Shiggy. Number 1. 
Next up is Doki Doki Yu Enchi. If I mangled the pronunciation of that, well sue me and I will counter sue and we'll sue back and forth forever. Anyway, in this platformer, you play as what appears to be a baseball player who kicks soccer balls for weapons. The game takes place in an amusement park and in one stage you're even riding on a roller coaster. The graphics have that isometric feel to them, so it can make things kind of tough sometimes. This was released in Europe as Trolls in Crazy Land. It's one of the few games that was actually optimized for PAL console, so it plays a bit too fast on NTSC consoles like mine. This time you're a naked little troll, which is based on those stupid troll dolls that were popular at the time. These dolls were designed on the likeness of Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. Anyway, the game is pretty much the same, but the faster speed really emphasizes the flaws. The collision detection is awful, and that makes the platforming awful. The gravity feels weird, and it's very difficult to control your jumps. The graphics are minimalist at best, and the music is almost good, but not quite. I'm glad we never got this one. You all can keep it. This is Crackout from Konami. I chose this one just because of the name, basically hoping I control a character whose job was to do as much crack as possible. But no, it's a breakout clone. And honestly, not a very good one either. There are enemies that float around the screen, and if you kill them, you can get power-ups that can help you in different ways. But check out the third board in the game. Yeah, good luck bouncing your ball through there. I can understand if this was a higher board, but this should not be the third one that people see. I must be missing something. Actually, I'm not, because even if I can shoot these silver blocks, this game is pretty boring. So don't feel bad that the US missed out on this one. Finally is a little shooter by Hot B called Over Horizon. This one plays as a normal shooter except that the A button shoots forward while the B button shoots behind you. You can get options and power ups and all that kind of stuff just like you'd expect. The graphics and music aren't bad and there's less slowdown than you'd think. The controls work well and you can even adjust your speed several levels with the select button. You respawn right where you die but without your collected weapons of course. It's really not a bad little shooter and I think it could have found an audience over here. This is Kuru Kuru Kururin for the Game Boy Advance. Great name, I know, right? Not long ago, I talked about Kururin Squash for the GameCube. I got a lot of positive response from that and suggestions to play this game. Well, since I own it and it fits into this episode, I'm going to talk about it. The story goes that Kururin's brothers and sisters have been lost in 10 different worlds. Your mom asks you to go and find them all, and being the good kid that you are, you take off in your helicopter and set out to find your siblings. If you're in a helicopter, wouldn't it be easier just to fly over these mazes to find your family? Yeah, it makes no sense to me, but you know what? I'm not playing this game for the heart-wrenching story. I really don't care about his siblings. I'm playing it because it's a fun game. Right from the beginning, the mazes that you guide Karu and through are challenging. They're narrow in a lot of places, and your helicopter has some long blades. Sure, I could play this game on easy mode, which would make the length of the blades shorter, but the problem is that I would have to turn in my gamer card for wussing out on a challenge. And I ain't no wussy! Another factor that makes this game hard is controlling your copter. As you know, the Game Boy Advance doesn't have an analog stick, so you're stuck using the directional pad, which makes your movements less precise. I feel having an analog stick would make the game a lot easier. There's one last control issue that I'd like to address. Your copter has two speeds. Normal, which is great for tight areas. And if you hold in the A button, you can go faster. This is nice, but I also would have welcomed the ability to speed up your copter's blades. Being able to do this would let you time the rotation to help navigate the tight areas. Without it, I felt that I was waiting on my blade to rotate normally before I could attempt corners and whatnot. Even though I had some problems with the controls, I still found this to be a very addictive game. Your helicopter has three hearts, which means that you can hit the walls three times before it explodes. On a side note, if you're going for a low time, keep in mind that every time you hit a wall, it adds three seconds to the clock. In every maze, there's at least one area that will refill your hearts that is usually halfway through. Longer mazes will have two areas like this. I always found these necessary since I was constantly banging into walls. Mazes vary in length, and some of them will have springs on the wall that you can hit. These will cause your blades to rotate in the opposite direction. Every area has three levels inside of it, and they all have different themes to them. The backgrounds are vibrant and detailed. They even have some animations here and there. Every time I'd try and look at the background, I'd hit a wall, so I wasn't able to enjoy them as much as I'd like to. Throughout a lot of the mazes, there will be little icons to collect. These icons let you customize your copter to an extent. You can change the color of your craft or even change the shape of the blades. None of this stuff affects the gameplay and it's just for looks only. 
I haven't beaten this game yet, but so far I haven't run into any boss battles. That was a cool feature in the GameCube game, and I kind of miss it here. So besides the single player adventure, there's also a challenge mode. These again are pretty tough right from the start. You only get two hearts for these, so good luck. There's also a versus mode, and you can hook up to four systems together. The cool thing is that only one game pack is needed. All in all, this is a great game, and I wonder why Nintendo didn't bring this one out here in the USA. Just a bad decision on their part. Now I need to hunt down Career in Paradise, which is another in the series for the Game Boy Advance, and another one that didn't get released here. All right, there's three games that easily should have made it out to this country, Joe. S just stupid, stupid that they didn't. It is stupid that they didn't. Why didn't they, Dave? Come because on. these stupid companies like Nintendo and Sega, I don't, thought it was smart to leave them out of here when we would have enjoyed them. Yeah, we would have bought them, but hey, yeah. you know, got to buy games like, I, I keep going back to this, but Green Dog instead. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, why didn't that one stay out of here? Yeah. Sheesh. No, well, I don't know. It, let's just take a look at some more. Zero Wing is a shooter for the Mega Drive by Toa Plan. I rented the Japanese version back in 1991 and it's also the same version that I presently own. This is a side-scrolling shooter which is pretty rare to see from Toa Plan since they like the overhead genre so much. There's nothing terribly unique about this one except that you can grab some of your enemies with your force beam. You'll keep them until you press the button again to release them. They can be used to toss into other enemies or a shield. Honestly, I rarely use this feature as there's really no need to, and plus, I just like shooting everything down with one of the three available weapons anyway. You've got the red weapon, which is your default, and it can be upgraded into a spread. Then there's the blue laser, which is a slightly more powerful straight laser type of thing. Then there's my personal favorite, the green weapon. This one is a heat-seeking shot, and it kicks ass. Each weapon can be powered up twice by collecting the colors again and again. You also stumble upon a bomb maybe once per stage if you're lucky. You hold on to it just like you would a captured enemy. When you release it, it does some pretty good damage, but it doesn't look very impressive. But that's okay. There's one other type of power-up that you can get that increases your speed. I don't recommend getting more than one of these if you even get any at all because the game never really requires you to move super quick. And in some parts of the game, excessive speed can be to your disadvantage due to the tight corridors. Anyway, one hit and you die and this sets you back and removes all of your power-ups. You also default back to the red weapon and no satellites. There is something about this game that's pretty fun despite its overall lack of pizzazz. Toa Plan kind of has a uniqueness to their games and it shines through here. The graphics are good, but certainly nothing on the level of, say, Thunder Force 4. The music though is fantastic and probably the best in any Toa Plan game I've heard. It really impressed the hell out of me back in 1991 when I first rented it. Speaking of the music, the bosses in this game do not feature their own theme, so you're never quite sure when you've come up to a stage boss. You never know, it could just be a mid-boss. Anyway, this one was released in Japan, obviously, and the intro has your typical Japanese text. But it was translated into English by Mrs. Green's preschool class and released in Europe. And that's where this game gets a lot of its notoriety, and deservedly so. In AD 2101, war was beginning. What happened? Somebody set up us the bomb. We get signal! What? Main screen turn on! It's you! How are you gentlemen? All your base are belong to us. You are on the way to destruction. What you say? You have no chance to survive. Make your time. Ha 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 ha! Captain! Take off every zig! You know what you're doing! Move zig! For great justice! See what I mean? This intro was responsible for some of the earliest memes on the internet. I'm not sure why this game didn't come out in the US, but I'm guessing it's because companies felt that there were already too many other shooters on the system, and this is something that magazines criticized all the time. 
It's too bad because it's a good game and it has a rockin' English intro that should never be changed. Here's Hammer and Harry, ghost building company for the Game Boy. Ooh, that sounds scary, doesn't it? This would be a great game to play around Halloween as it's filled with all sorts of undead and ghost type enemies. And yes, the game came out in Europe and Japan. There was supposed to be a release here in the US, but it got canceled. I hope whoever made this decision choked on their dinner that night. Again, I was left to importing it. I bought the Japanese version because it's way cheaper than the one that was released in Europe. For games like this, it doesn't matter since there is very little text in the game, so I can pretty much figure out what's going on by the cutscenes. So for some reason, a ghost has taken your love interest. He then retreats into a building and turns it evil and fills it with ghastly enemies. Little does he know who he's messing with. I mean, did he not see the rather large hammer Harry was toting on his shoulder? The game is an action platformer and plays like most entries into the series. Harry has his hammer as a weapon and that's all he needs. He can swing it straight in front of himself for a regular attack. Not only does he attack enemies this way, but he can also repel enemy shots fired at him. I love games that let you do this, and the only thing you have to worry about is timing your swing. If you push up and attack, he'll of course attack enemies slightly above his head. This is also useful on some of the bosses he fights in the game. Like this one here where the boss drops junk from above. Harry's hammer has no problem taking out so you won't lose any life. He can also pound the ground with his hammer and this will stun enemies just for a brief moment. And that's enough for you to get close enough to smash him. There's more than a few things Harry can pick up along the way to help him. He can get a larger hammer with spikes on it. This is great because it halves the number of hits that you need to give some enemies. He can get a hard hat which will let him take a hit without losing any of his life bar. And finally he can get some food to help replenish his life bar. The game starts out fairly easy and lets you get the feel for the control and get used to the slower pace from previous games. Being on the Game Boy I think this was slowed down to help with the blurring effect from the handheld. Each level is fairly long and is divided into four parts. A boss battle awaits at the end of these. As you get further into the game it becomes much more difficult. There's lots of enemies coming at you and lots of tricky platforming to get past. Like here in the fourth stage. How in the hell are you supposed to survive this? Platforms collapse and enemies are all over the place. Good luck! But hey look at those graphics! There's a ton of detail in the backgrounds and sprites. Plus you get a better than average soundtrack. There's only a few songs that really suck and for some reason those belong to the shooter stages. This music here is bad, but the stage itself is fun. I like how Harry blows in the wind when he's not firing his weapon. It just looks so funny. The stage itself is easy and it has a fun boss fight at the end with some scary triple skull looking thing. One more really cool thing about this game is that there are quite a few digitized voice samples. They're all pretty clear and I've actually heard much worse samples on the Genesis. As you know, I'm a big fan of the Game Boy and I think this game is worth the import. It's just a shame that it wasn't released here. And now the one that a lot of you have been waiting for us to cover, Terranigma on the Super Nintendo from Enix. This is a really cool action RPG developed by Quintet. Released in Japan as Tenchi Sozo, it was originally going to be a sequel to The Illusion of Gaia. But let's concentrate on the English version that was released in Europe. It never came out in the US because Enix was no longer in business here when the game was completed. Also there's some Christian imagery in here and oh uh oh Nintendo doesn't like that. Anyway, you play as Ark and you're a complete idiot because you mess up the entire world in the beginning of the game basically due to peer pressure. I hate this guy already. So there's a light side and a dark side, or rather an inner earth and an outer earth. It's all kind of convoluted, but all you really need to know is that you screwed up the balance of everything when you opened this box that you were told never to touch. Now everyone else is frozen. Well, everyone except the shop owners, of course. Thank goodness because you're gonna need to buy some stuff. Basically, to fix your mess, you need to start by visiting five different towers. Each tower plays similar to the dungeons in any Zelda or any other action RPG game. Except here you level up like a real RPG. Often, you've got to satisfy specific requirements to open up the passageway to the next level. Once you get to the top, you fight a little battle and then you can free a continent. Then it's off to the next tower. And of course, each tower gets progressively longer and harder. Er, yeah. But the towers really are only the first part of the game. 
The box that you opened in the beginning is basically your menu screen. In here you'll have access to all of your normal things like items and weapons as well as your map which can come in handy. You access this box by pressing select. Gotta love the select button, it does not get enough love. As far as gameplay goes, you do have a different number of moves you can do other than just a generic attack. You can also jump and dash and these of course can be combined with an attack. You also have a shield which can block weak attacks. There's lots of towns to visit and people to talk to. The overworld doesn't have any random battles that you have to worry about so just wander around everywhere. Eventually you'll get the ability to talk to animals and hell even plants. Ever wonder what a cactus has to say? Well it's gonna be something relevant to your quest, guaranteed. But this doesn't last forever sadly. Overall the story isn't bad and it definitely gets better as you go. I find it interesting that they used real world places like Tibet and even my home state of Colorado is in here. But this is the year so I guess that's expected and the opening says that it's 46 billion years old. That's pretty old. So if this is the same earth then this game takes place about 41 and a half billion years in the future. How the hell they kept the sun alive that long much less the planet is anyone's guess. Anyway my biggest issue with this game is probably the font. It's huge and it looks pretty chunky. This gives the game a slightly lower budget feel than if it had a more appealing font I think. The size is so huge that sometimes they even have to abbreviate like when you're asking where the weavers are here. It's just a bad presentation of the dialogue. But come on, the game's gotta be pretty damn good when the font is my biggest gripe. The graphics are pretty nice and fairly typical of Super Nintendo RPG style games. Lots of detail and some transparency providing some lighting effects and even cool color effects. The overworld map is mode 7 that appears to curve just like the planet itself. What really looks cool is the overworld map in the beginning of the game with its crazy weird distortion effects. You better get to those towers and fix things. I mean this is not normal. The sound and music are enjoyable. The music fits but it's not something that you're going to desire the full soundtrack for. At least I didn't. There's definitely a few standout tunes here and there but mostly it's what you'd expect in a Super Nintendo RPG game with the same types of string instruments all over the place. There's one sound effect that's kind of odd. There's a thump sound if you bump into something as you're running around. This particular sound effect is definitely not right and it seems so out of place. I run everywhere I go so I hear it a lot. Honestly I think it'd be better if there were no sound effect at all when this happened. The rest of the sound effects are fine. Overall this is a great game and it's really sad that we missed out on it here. It'll take you maybe a bit over 20 hours to complete and it's definitely worth your time. Hell I say go for it no matter what country you're in. The cartridge will run on a US Super Nintendo as long as you pull those stupid tabs out. And there you go, there's a handful of games that did not come out in the US, but came out in multiple other regions. And as far as I can see, there's absolutely no good reason they, that they were left out of the US. They mm -hmm. should have came over here. And, and what do you guys think? And do you have any certain favorite games that you wish would have come out in the US but didn't? Or how about that didn't come out in Europe? God, there's a ton of games that came mm -hmm. out in Japan and the US that didn't come out in Europe. Yeah. Or you know, even games that came out in the US and Europe that didn't come out in Japan, there are a lot of those too. Mm -hmm. So let us know what you guys think of you know, games like that. Give us ideas. We can do like a, a not yeah. in Japan or a, a not in Europe episode in the future. Yeah, those would be good ideas for sure. So. Yeah. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. So Dave, when we do a Not in Europe episode, you know what we should include? What's that? The Super Nintendo. I'm pretty sure they got the Super Nintendo, Joe. But they didn't get the sweet ass sexy boxy edition. This is exclusive to the US. You're exactly right. You know what? They got the one that looks like the Super Famicom and it's all slanted and weird looking. And then this one has sweet purple buttons. I mean, it's got this flat part back here to put a soda on. Yeah. And, uh, Maybe a hot dog or something like that? Yeah, look at these. The, these, these ridges? Mm -hmm. that, that kicks ass. Who wouldn't want that? Yeah, I mean, it looks like it, it came out of a cake pan. Yeah. And who doesn't like cake? <laughs> you know what? If I was European, I would have to import this one because it's such a better design. Absolutely. Oh my God.
Europe's dumb. <laughs>